Hey guys, welcome to AP Biology. Uh, we're going to talk about eukaryotic uh, genome control or mechanisms for gene expression in today's lecture. We've already discussed prokaryotic gene control, talking about the operon system. Now we're going to go into the eukaryotic gene control. And uh, first of all, there are different levels of uh, gene control expression, uh, okay? Short-term control, like I say, up here to meet the daily needs of the organisms, and long-term control, gene regulation and development and differentiation. So what's the difference? Well, long-term control is going to be as a cell begins to specialize. That is going from a stem cell, which is can become almost any cell, to become something specialized like a a lens cell in your eye or a liver cell or a bone cell or a cell that's in your tooth or something of that nature, that long-term control, we're going to see different genes be permanently turned off in those cells that begin to specialize. Whereas in the stem cells, none of those genes would really be turned off. Uh, Short-term control is uh, how are we going to regulate those uh, or turn on those genes that are necessary for the daily requirements of that particular uh, cell. And um, what you can see down here on the bottom in this particular diagram is all the levels of DNA, uh, I should, should say all the levels of control where we can control gene expression and the ultimate uh, product of that, which would be uh, an active protein. And as you can see, we can have uh, controls at transcriptional level, the RNA processing level, RNA transport level, translation level, messenger RNA degradation level, and actually at the protein activity, okay? What's happening with that protein? So we can control it at many more places than we can in a prokaryote. Remember, in a prokaryote, we can turn the operon on or we can turn the operon off. So in any typ typical cell, only about 30 to 40 percent of the total number of genes will be um, will be expressed. So in specialized cells, such as a muscle, nerve, or eye, as I say up here, even less cells will be, excuse me, even less fewer genes will be expressed. And well, how does that process happen? It's through differential gene expression. That basically means that some cells are gonna be, are gonna turn on certain genes and which are gonna be different than other types of cells. So only a small fraction of the total number of genes with in any particular cell are going to be turned on and turned into protein products. And do remember all cells basically have the same DNA. So some of the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, do remember gene expression in prokaryotes is regulated by the operon, which controls uh, multiple genes, okay? Eukaryotic um, operons, if you will, only control a single gene at a time. Okay, so that's one difference. Uh, like I say up here, operons are not known to control. Eh, not really, but you know, eukaryotic genomes still have a similar system. They have a promoter site, uh, regulatory sites, and things of that nature, and then the gene that they are controlling. Um, do you remember eukaryotic gene regulation is more complex, mainly because the eukaryotes have that nucleus where, which is going to separate the process of transcription and translation. We've already mentioned short-term and long-term categories of uh, eukaryotic gene control. All right, once again, here is a, another diagram showing you where all of the levels of control are at transcription, RNA processing, messenger RNA transport, where is it going? Is it going to a cytoplasmic RNA or is it going to an RNA found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum? Uh, translation, when and where that translation is happening, um, how long that messenger RNA is active within the cell before it is degraded, and finally, various types of protein modifications and degradations that can happen. Those are all levels of eukaryotic gene control versus the one we found in prokaryotes, which is either on or off. Okay. Um, so one of the beginnings we have to deal with is when transcription occurs. 
Remember, um, the process of transcription will occur when DNA is in the chromatin form, i.e. the uncoiled form, because if it's tightly coiled up, then those genes will not be accessible. So we can think of when does the DNA in a eukaryotic cell exist in the chromatin form? Well, that's going to be the entire process of interphase, which is going to be G1, S, and G2. Okay, do you remember also pro, or eukaryotic DNA is structurally more complex than prokaryotic DNA because there, A, there's a lot more of it, okay, and in order to get all that DNA into a cell, it has to be wrapped around these protein spools called histones. And histones do have these little tails that come out of them. And these little tails can act as attachment sites for other types of epigenetic factors, which will play a role uh, in gene expression. So, uh, like I said, in order to get all of that DNA into your cells, it has to be coiled tightly into these and packaged very carefully. And the first level of packaging is going to be wrapped around those histones. And then those histones will condense more to form a nucleosome, and then they'll start to loop more during the process as, we, as the cell starts to move into mitosis until we actually get to see those replicated bivalent chromosomes, uh, which are supercoiled, and none of the genes are really accessible at that point. So the nucleosome and the nucleosome level is about the is where we're going to see. So this first level right here, and maybe the second level, that's when DNA could potentially be accessed for, in order to turn on genes. So when you look at a cell uh, during interphase, you're going to see, um, you might see a, a nucleus that looks like this. You'll see some dark spots in the center, and those could be parts of the nucleolus, and there's oftentimes more than one. And then you'll see all this dark stuff in here. Well, what is that dark stuff? Oh, excuse me. That dark stuff you see like here in spots, that is tightly coiled DNA uh, in the, uh, again, where those genes that are found in those regions are inaccessible. Look at all these mitochondria off around the side. I was just looking at this picture right here. Lots of mitochondria there. But all of that dark spot represents heterochromatin. That, the genes found in those regions are inaccessible. Uh, the other type of DNA that is this lighter gray color that's all throughout that nucleus, that is euchromatin, and that DNA is accessible for transcription and translation. So the stuff that's in heterochromatin, that, that's, those genes are turned off for long term, and they might have been turned off uh, several cell divisions earlier or way earlier when that cell began to specialize, and those genes will never be turned on in that cell or in its daughter cells. So again, DNA control stages and protein synthesis, we're going to be talking a little bit in nucleus, the first place where it happens, in the DNA structure. And that's the difference between the euchromatin and the heterochromatin. Heterochromatin, once again, uh, those genes are permanently turned off in that cell and in its daughter cell. So euchromatin genes are still active. How does that happen? Part of that is through, through these epigenetic tags, which generally consist of one of two different types of molecules. Uh, one is methylation or methyl groups, which is CH3. And those methyl groups will hook onto those uh, DNA tails and it will cause that DNA, as you can see on the bottom down here, you see the methyl groups are um, the red dots and the nucleosomes are very close together, and those genes are turned off. Now, when the methyl groups um, fall off and acetyl groups get put on, then these nucleosomes spread out and those genes become active. So the bottom part would represent like heterochromatin, this bottom one down here, and the top one right here would represent euchromatin. So again, sometimes these epigenetic factors are, can be made permanent in a particular cell lineage. So how does this actually happen? Well, histone tails have a positive charge, and if you remember, DNA has a negative charge. So they sort of attract each other and causing them to basically uh, clump up very tightly. 
acetyl groups, and that's this up here in the upper right-hand corner is an acetyl group, and you can see it has an oxygen molecule there, and it has a methyl group on there. Acetyl groups have a positive charge, and those positive charge on the acetyl groups will help to negate the negative charge on, of the DNA, and so it lessens that attraction between the histones and the DNA and helps to spread it out a little bit. And so remember, methyl groups are going to cause the chromatin to, to condense and acetyl groups are going to cause the chromatin to open up. So see more acetyl groups in the euchromatin, more methyl groups in the heterochromatin. Um, the next stage, if we go up, the next stage that has to happen is transcription itself. And transcription is going to begin by having a whole bunch of different types of transcription factors, which are various proteins, to assemble at the promoter site of a eukaryotic gene. And then once enough of the different types of transcription factors are there, then and only then will RNA polymerase come in and bind to that site and begin the transcription process. And there are lots of different types of molecules. There's, there are enhancer molecules and uh, activator molecules, which will all play a role in transcription. And the other point you need to know is not every single cell has the same types of transcription factors, because transcription factors are oftentimes going to be proteins and RNA products. And as, as, I, as we said earlier, only, you know, 20 to maybe 40% of the genes in any particular cell are going to be turned on. And many of these genes are coding for different types of activators and transcription factors. So if a particular cell, like an eye cell, doesn't have um, transcription factors for producing a liver cell, you're never going to produce a liver cell in an eye cell and vice versa. And so this is all part of transcriptional control. Okay, so here's an example of what I just said. Um, on the left-hand side, we see uh, some genes uh, that we have enhancer genes and the albumin genes and crystalline genes and stuff. Uh, this yellow, gray, and red on the top one are control elements that code for different types of, um, you know, proteins and RNA groups and things of that nature. And as you can see in the liver cell, um, we do not see the genes for forming lens crystal, uh, like for the crystalline gene, even though it would have the, you know, a cell in the liver would have the gene for, for making uh, an eye lens. It does not have the enhancers or the control elements there in that particular cell being active. And so, uh, therefore, it will not express those particular um, genes at all. Other types of um, uh, uh, factors that can be found are these microRNAs and small interfering RNAs, which are, again, are small RNA sequences that can block translation or degrade messenger RNAs. These can be uh, turned on or turned off, and we're going to find these a little bit later. Um, they're af they occur after RNA processing, and um, they can, like I said, block trans block translation or degrade um, messenger RNAs. So that's another form of eukaryotic gene control. Going back to splicing, that slide was out of order. I'm sorry there. Um, control of exons. So we're talking once again in transcription. And remember, uh, eukaryotes have multiple exons within a gene, and we need to get rid of the introns, and these exons can be put together in different ways. And those exons are going to, or the introns are going to be taken out by uh, a, a um, structure called a spliceosome, which is made up of these uh, SNRPs and other proteins, and those come together to remove the introns. And once again, we can put those uh, exons together into different ways in order to make different types of proteins, as this figure shows. It shows different exons being spliced together, which lead to different, um, three different shapes of proteins. And the average gene, I think, codes for three to four different proteins, all in all. So uh, there's a good example of how alternate splicing can affect the final outcome of the protein. So another level of control, which occurs during um, transcription. Excuse me. Excuse me there. 
which can occur during transcription. And also remember uh, how long that messenger RNA is going to remain active in the cytoplasm uh, is a result of how many adenines are put on that poly A tail. So a whole bunch of adenines on that poly A tail means more protein being built. A few adenines on that tail means less protein gets built. Also, uh, location. Where is that protein being made? Okay, uh, there are small signals at the beginning of the messenger RNA that help to guide that messenger RNA to its appropriate location, either a cytoplasmic uh, ribosome or a ribosome located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And again, uh, rib uh, proteins that are translated on a ribosome on the F on the RER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, are generally going to be bound for a couple of different places. The cell membrane, to act as something like a receptor protein or a transport protein. Uh, outside of the cell, maybe a digestive enzyme to be used in your stomach or something like that, or even packaged into uh, something like a lysosome uh, to act as an intracellular digesting uh, molecule or something. Okay. Um, also, once that messenger RNA does get transcribed, uh, let's say it's on a cytoplasmic uh, ribosome, if it's a very complicated protein, uh, it can actually be put into a special structure called the chaperonin, which is like a little cup, if you will, that has a molecular environment that will lead to a correctly folded protein. Okay, so those chaperonin proteins are going to uh, make sure that a, a cytoplasmic ribosome's protein uh, will be folded in its correct shape. Again, if that uh, messenger RNA uh, goes to a ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, then that protein is most likely going to be bound for some place besides the cell interior, i.e. the cell membrane or completely out of the cell itself. And again, inside that, um, once it's inside, it gets translocated, excuse me, it gets translated inside of the RER, and that's a different environment than the cytoplasm, plasm, so that can lead to different folding. Also, that polypeptide might be added on to, uh, it could be uh, cut up in pieces, lots of different things can happen to it once it is inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum and also as it travels through the Golgi apparatus before uh, going to either the cell membrane or leaving the cell itself. Finally, uh, what can happen to, old, to proteins once they have been made? Well, they can be broken down. Okay, a, there's a signal molecule called ubiquitin, which is another small protein, uh, which will attach to the protein that is targeted. And then um, that's going to help it uh, be targeted by something called a proteasome, which will then basically break up all of the amino acids or, or break up the polypeptide ice chain, I should say, and uh, release short peptide fragments. What's a short peptide fragment? That's, you know, two, three, four, five different amino acids stuck together, and they can then be utilized uh, or reutilized in the cell someplace in the cell. And that is the lecture on eukaryotic gene control. Make sure you look at your notes in uh, your digital notes, and also make sure to check out chapter 18 in your textbook. I hope this helps, and thanks for listening.